Hey guys, welcome to the channel. If you're new here, I do weekly uploads on some of the most horrendous and mysterious cases around the world. So if you're a true crime fan like I am, please make sure to hit that subscribe button. Little side note here, I plan on doing a giveaway when we hit 500 subscribers just to show you guys how much I appreciate you showing love to the channel. So if you have any ideas that are gender neutral, please drop them in the comment section below so that we can get it done. All right, now before we get started, I want to take a quick second to give you guys a speculation warning because although I have tried to weed out the opinions and only use factual information, we have to be mindful that this is still the internet and even if you may think so, not everything you see is 100% true. Okay guys, for the sake of today's video, we're going to Hamilton, Ohio. Now, me personally, I don't have to physically go anywhere considering this is my hometown and all, but don't worry, y'all are coming with me. Hamilton is located 20 miles north of Cincinnati with a population of about 63,000 people. This case we're about to discuss was huge and it ended up being covered by the media everywhere, but I promise once we get into the details, you guys will understand why. So on March 8, 2018, a then 35-year-old Lindsay Parton called 911 and told the Butler County Dispatcher that the girl she was babysitting just passed out shortly after her father dropped her off around 7 a.m. I'm just going to go ahead and play a portion of the 911 call for you guys now. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. What's going on? Okay, my name is Lindsay. I babysit kids. Yes. And he just dropped her off, and um, all of a sudden she just passed out. Who's passed out? The little girl. She's three. She she fell pretty bad yesterday, and she's okay. fine. And all of a sudden he dropped her off this morning, and she walked in, and she just kind of passed out, and she went limp. Okay. I don't know. Are you with her now? Yes, and those are bad. I called her. Yes, hurry. She's bad. There's something wrong. Okay. Is she awake right now? Yes. No, 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 stay on the line with me. I have to ask you two questions while my partner gets the medics dispatched. Okay, is she breathing? Yeah, I sent him out. Okay. Yeah, I sent him out. I don't know what's wrong. Okay, is her breathing completely normal? Oh, yeah, it's almost gone. Hurry, please. Okay, lay down on her back. Lay her down on her back and let her head okay, tilt back. Okay, Is she still unconscious, correct? Yes. Okay. No, she's not unconscious. She, she, her eyes are open and she's like gasping for air. What's the matter? She's fucking shock or something. I don't know what, what could be wrong with her. I don't know. She's a fire. Who just walked in the house? She got up, brushed her teeth. I don't know. I Lindsay, it's okay. They're on the way. She just walked in the house and just passed out. Hey. Parkinson. Hey. Let's look at Daddy. Anna. Look up. Uh, you you're here. okay. I love you. I know. I love you, Buttercup. Hey. Wake up. There we go. See, Hannah Weshi was just a three-year-old little girl who had already been through so much in her short little life. When Hannah was born, no one was honestly sure whether or not she was going to survive due to her mother's drug use during the pregnancy. Where was Hannah born? In Louisville, Kentucky. Did she have any difficulty at her birth? She was addicted to drugs at birth. And tell me about that process at birth and um, how long she was in the hospital and what happened from there. She was in, I'm not sure, Cozair Children's Hospital in Louisville um, for 92 days. She was weaned off of methadone uh, by morphine. Where did she stay while she was in the hospital there? in the NICU, the intensive, intensive care unit. And with that, can you describe what type of care she needed? She had different kind of tubes. Um, she just had to have medicine to come down and wean her from the medicine that she was on to keep her from heroin. She was, her mother was addicted to heroin. So when her mother got arrested, the jail put her on methadone to keep the baby alive to, instead of withdrawing instantly from heroin. So in the hospital, they wean them off the heroin, and it takes quite some time. But like the little fighter she was, she pulled through and was thriving. When Hannah was just four months old, her father, Jason Weshi, had some unfortunate events happen, which resulted in him losing his job and then being homeless for a while. But Jason was able to work out a deal with his brother that would allow Hannah to sleep inside of his brother's house while Jason slept outside in his car, 
And according to Jason's brother, this went on for two years. He said that Jason would and did everything he could for his daughters. After the two years was up, Jason finally landed himself a construction job, which was nice because it gave him the opportunity to get his life back on track. He was able to rent a home and get his babies back under one roof with their daddy, so he was happy. He truthfully thought things were starting to look up for him, and he was proud of himself for making that happen. If you want my honest opinion, he should be proud. Seeing anyone in life grow, get better, and succeed is always a blessing in my eyes because it's not easy by any means. Now don't get me wrong, in order to get back on track and provide like he needed to, he was working 12-hour shifts which meant that he had to drop Hannah off at Lindsay's house so that Lindsay could babysit while he was at work. Lindsay lived next door to Jason, so he would bring Hannah over to her house as early as 6 a.m. sometimes, but he didn't think too much into it because Lindsay had two kids of her own and she also babysat an additional child. While Hannah was in her care, Lindsay acted as a positive figure in her life. She would feed her dinner, take her to dance class, and even wash her clothes sometimes. On March 8, 2018, just minutes after Jason dropped Hannah off to go to work, Lindsay called him and told him something was wrong with her and that he needed to come back immediately. Of course, like any dad would do, Jason raced back over to her house and when he got there, Hannah was struggling to breathe and was unresponsive every parent's worst nightmare. Once he got there, Lindsay asked if she should call 911 and frantically, Jason said yes. EMS arrived on scene and rushed Hannah to the Fort Hamilton Hospital. And given the injuries and seriousness of the injuries, doctors and investigators immediately suspected that Hannah's injuries were not by accident. Evan Reedy was the first EMT to arrive on the scene, and he testified that when he did arrive, Hannah was laid on a couch, her breathing was very shallow and irregular, and her eyes were moving around, but not with purpose. You didn't have concerns about her breathing? I had concerns that it was a little bit shallow and rapid and, and like, again, that sniffing. But as far as her oxygen saturation, that's not concerning to me. The, the inadequate breathing, like I said, the, the, the rate at which she was breathing was just odd, not normal. Gotcha. And um, you have the training, education, and experience to ventilate? Not with a ventilator. We can use a bag valve mask, which is the, right. which is the bat, yeah. yeah. And that's to support breathing? Correct. All right. You didn't do that? No, she didn't need it. Okay. And then... The, um, the notation on the far right, GCS, that stands for... Glasgow Coma Scale. Right. And that's a measurement of... Alert, responsiveness, right. awareness. The higher the number, the better the score. Correct. 15 is the highest you can get. 3 is the lowest. The GCS, again, look at here, which is 11. Yeah. Not an overly concerning reading. Yes. Anything below 15 is concerning. Right. Okay. Reedy also noticed some bruising on different parts of Hannah's body, including her chest and eyes, which appeared to be sunken in. And would you agree with me that the first and only um, <coughs> statement about bruises occurs where my finger is? Okay. And that reads, first assessment found multiple bruises all over patient's body. Patient has sunken in eye sockets, also bruised, all bruises in multiple stages of healing, correct? Correct. Okay. So you, you didn't, for whatever reason, you didn't describe the location of the bruises uh, on the body, did you? Correct. There's a lot. Okay. When Lindsay was asked about the bruises, she told him, a deputy sheriff that was on scene, and another EMT that Hannah was standing on a toy the day before and fell off of it, which is how she got the bruises. Deputy Damon Mayer testified that he was on road patrol for the Butler County Sheriff's Office that morning, and when he responded to the 911 call, Lindsay told him that Hannah walked through the garage and up the steps, then asked her for a donut and said she wanted to sit on the couch. Lindsay claims that right after this, Hannah just passed out and fell forward on the carpet. 
Of course, EMS rushed her to Fort Hamilton Hospital, and when she arrived, Dr. Ankon Nguyen was her physician. At this point, Hannah was unresponsive and not able to breathe on her own, so the doctors had to move quick in order to get her placed on a ventilator. While in the process of doing that, Dr. Nguyen realized that her pupils were not reacting appropriately and that there was blood behind her eyes, not to mention the bruises on her body. Of course, knowing that, the doctor ordered a CAT scan of Hannah's head, neck, and face. While at Fort Hamilton Hospital, did you order any additional screening? Yes. What did you order? A CT of her head, her neck, and her face. <clears throat> and did you remain with Hannah as those were completed? Yes. And were those completed then that morning on March 8th? Yes then ordered that she be transported via air care to the Cincinnati Children's Hospital for further treatment. Did you contact any outside hospital for assistance in treatment with Hannah? Yes. And who did you contact? Cincinnati Children's Emergency Department. And based on that contact, what was your plan of care? Um, we were to intubate her and set up for a air care transport to their emergency department. And then did you do that? Yes. Once Hannah arrived at Children's, Dr. Carre reviewed her CAT scans taken at Fort Hamilton, and that is when they learned that Hannah had a subdural hemorrhage. Um, what that's showing is the line going down the middle is showing where the ventricles or the fluid spaces that we all have in the brain should normally be located. And you can see that they are these are the fluid spaces that are the dark spaces off to the side. Well, let's just go back to, to starting with the basics. So this is the bone. The white area out here is the child's bone. The inside here is the child's brain, and then um, we'll get to the bleed here in a minute, um, which is this portion over here. Um, so what we're trying to look for is um, we look for sort of symmetry between the two sides. When we look at imaging, this is the right side of the body and the left side of the body. We always sort of look at um, our imaging like we're looking at the patient, and so um, it sometimes gets a little confusing as to which side we're on. So um, the child's brain is being pushed over to the left side, and there's this area outside of the brain um, that's in the subdural um, space, and that's a um, uh, moderately sized um, collection that's got high attenuation or bright white. Um, high attenuation is something that we see with hemorrhage um, that's um, recently occurred. Um, it's got some areas of dark in it. So to me, this is um, a subdural hemorrhage. For those of you that don't know the medical terminology, a subdural hemorrhage is when there is significant bleeding inside the skull, causing pressure to build rapidly against the brain, and it happens mainly when a severe head injury occurs. Based on the findings in the CAT scan, Dr. Carre determined that Hannah required immediate medical intervention, so she shared her findings with a neurosurgeon who then removed a part of Hannah's skull in order to drain the hemorrhage. The surgery would be successful in that aspect, however, because her brain had swollen from the injury, it began to swell out of the area where the surgeon removed the portion of her skull. Dr. Young is an ophthalmologist at Cincinnati Children's, and he is the one that examined Hannah's eyes and found that she had hemorrhages in both eyes, and not even just that. The hemorrhages were present in all three layers of the eye. With this in mind, he knew that Hannah's eye condition wasn't from just a fall. It was consistent with non-accidental head trauma and severe brain injury. Following Hannah's emergency surgery, she was transferred to ICU and Dr. Chima was the one responsible for her care at this point. Dr. Chima testified that Hannah never regained consciousness and her condition only deteriorated from here. After three days, the doctors knew that Hannah was progressing toward brain death and unfortunately, on March 18, 2018, just 10 days after the initial incident, doctors pronounced Hannah deceased due to her becoming brain dead. All of the doctors working on and with Hannah agreed that the cause of death was a traumatic brain injury due to a blunt, tremendous force that went through her brain. Considering she was in Lindsay's care when the incident took place, the first thing investigators did was bring Lindsay in for questioning at the Butler County Sheriff's Office. So on March 8th, which is the day Hannah went to the hospital, they questioned Lindsay and of course, she denied any knowledge of what happened. She claimed that Hannah seemed fine until she just collapsed out of nowhere walking into her home. I didn't do that. I don't know. Okay. I really didn't do that. I don't know. How does this happen? 
Detectives knew that wasn't possible, so it was obvious she was either lying to them or leaving stuff out one. As the interview began, a detective told Lindsay that Hannah died, which was not true at the time, but they wanted to see how she reacted. But nevertheless, she continued to deny knowing anything about what caused Hannah to become unresponsive. She said that Jason carried her into the garage that morning, and when he did, Lindsay said she remembered looking at Hannah's face and telling Jason, her face looks good and her bruise looks better. She added in that Hannah was acting completely normal and even asked her dad for a hug and kiss bye. Later in the interview, detectives left Lindsay alone in a room, and when they walked out, you could hear and see Lindsay on the camera saying, I'm going to prison for the rest of my life. I'm actually going to go ahead and play some of the interview for you guys now. After all, injured this kid to the point where she's unconscious. Or a dramatic fall, or something. Or some sort of accident. No, I mean, I believe you, but that accidental drop. Yes, something. Something absolutely happened while, when she walked in the door to the time she fell. That's the time frame that there's no doubt. It's not a question of, well, maybe it happened to There's no doubt. It absolutely happened during this time. And the only person that was there was a couple of kids and you. Yeah. That's what we're running into. So, something. I did not do anything to her. So we're not saying you did No, I know. But no, I honestly, she did. But we're just saying you know, okay? I mean, you would, you would have seen her, you saw her collapse. It was immediate that she collapsed. You, 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 said you, you said you, you never lost eye contact with her. With, with the time she walked in, yeah. you followed her in and she collapsed. The detectives ended up letting her go for the day and brought her back in on March 9th, which was the following day, so that they could question her some more. But this time, she told a different story. About 50 minutes into the interview, Lindsay admitted for the first time that something had happened to Hannah that morning after she was dropped off. She said Hannah slipped in the entryway door going from the garage to the house, causing her to hit her head on a concrete step. What accident caused this? She fell on the door and hit the concrete step. When? Thursday morning. Walking into the, walk yeah. the house? Yes. Tell us about it. Take us through the details. So when I opened up the door, she was coming through and she slipped on that concrete step and the metal part, she hit the metal part on her eye. Which door? The, the one. Door yeah, the one into the house, house the carpet. And so I got her back up and she stood up and looked up at me and did say, I want donut and couch and then collapsed. We appreciate you being honest there. I mean, you know, it's an accident. I thought it was my fault and I thought she was having a seizure and I didn't want Jason to be mad at me that she slipped and fell and I wasn't holding her and I was trying to grab her blanket from her. Here's, here's the thing. But I thought it was my here's, fault that she was having a seizure. I thought she was having a seizure. I was scooping on her mouth. Lindsay said even after that fall though, she stood Hannah up and Hannah again said, I want donuts and couch then collapsed. Of course, the detectives interviewing Lindsay told her that the kind of fall she was describing would not cause the injuries that Hannah sustained, according to what the doctors were saying, and again, they just encouraged her to tell the truth. You would be a fool to think that she didn't change her story again, because she did, and this time, she said that when she opened the door, she slipped and fell, which made her drop Hannah. And I fell, she fell. Where, did, where were you at when you fell? Um, against the door, trying to get uh, the door, the door open. I was holding her, the blanket was kind of like falling because he had handed her to me, and I put her down, and I picked her, no, he put her down, and when he walked out the door, I picked her up with the blanket, and it got tangled up, and when I opened up the door, it got tangled, and I slipped. So are you on the concrete floor, are you on the step, or are you on the top step? I was on, getting ready, I was trying to step up to go inside, I lost my balance, the blanket got underneath my foot and we both fell. She smacked her face on that concrete step and I hit the door. Again, detectives told her that a fall would not cause the severe injuries Hannah sustained and questioned her some more. Now we're getting to the part where Lindsay really starts to admit her wrongs, slowly but surely. This time she said that she probably shook Hannah hard after the fall for one minute, claiming her head was snapping around. 
Of course, this wasn't the truth either. Lindsay would change her story one more time, and this time, she admitted that she shook Hannah before the alleged fall. I guess Hannah had been whining every morning because she did not want her dad to leave her there and go to work, and obviously, that infuriated Lindsay. So Lindsay said that is when she picked her up, shook her, squeezed her, then they both fell. After Lindsay got up from the fall, she admitted to violently shaking her again while yelling, Stop doing this already! Apparently, Lindsay even admitted that she shook her until she stopped whining. With respect to some of the bruising around Hannah's head, Lindsay said earlier in the week she slapped Hannah upside the head because she took ketchup and squirted it in the toilet. I was just I slapped her upside the head. With what? My hand. Open, closed? Yeah, open. Well, what what caused that? She took all of the, I don't know why she was in trouble, she took all the ketchup out and squirted it into the toilet while it wasn't working. That's frustrating! And I'm like, yeah! Julia! Yeah. When she looked, or caught her doing the ketchup, you know, I took it away and I put her on the body because I think she had to go pee anyway. I said, Hannah, you can't do the ketchup. When she was asked about how she got the bruise on her chin, Lindsay admitted that she struck her under the chin twice. When they had Lindsay demonstrate the strikes, she demonstrated an uppercut-like motion that you would see in MMA. Lastly, the bruises on Hannah's chest that Lindsay originally claimed was caused by her falling on gravel or rocks was actually from Lindsay aggressively poking Hannah. When Lindsay was asked why she would do these things, she explained that it was because Hannah was mischievous and because she herself was frustrated with personal problems. Hannah's dad, Jason, testified that on the week of March 4th, he had conversations with Lindsay in regards to some of the injuries he noticed on Hannah, but he said that Lindsay always came up with an answer as to what caused it and he didn't think she would do anything like this, especially having kids of her own and watching another person's child, so he didn't harp on it too much. Between Monday, March 5th and Thursday, March 8th, were you aware of Hannah receiving any injuries? Yes. And how did you become aware of that? Lindsay told me after I picked Hannah up. Did that happen one day, multiple, multiple days? How many times were there conversations about injuries that Hannah had that week? She fell in the driveway. I want to say three. Well, tell me, to your recollection, what injuries do you recall Hannah having in those days leading up to March 8th and what Lindsay told you about those? She had little bruises all over her chest and a pretty bad scrape on the chin. Um, when I picked her up, Lindsay said that her and her daughter Vivian were playing in the driveway and Hannah had tripped over the heel of her boot and fell on the rocks. Um, she had a bruise on her chin and a black eye. But one day, Lindsay said that she had stepped up on top of a toy on wheels and the toy kicked out from underneath of her and she fell on the handlebar. When the investigators got Lindsay's phone and pulled her search records, they seen that on March 7th, just a day prior to the incident, Lindsay used Google search to look up how to get rid of a bruise, but it was deleted off of her phone. The same day at 2.56 p.m., Lindsay searched what essential oils are good for bruises and is vapor rub good for bruises, but those searches were not deleted. On March 8th at 9.13 p.m., Lindsay again searched how to get rid of a bruise, and this search yeah, that search was deleted. With this information, a Butler County grand jury indicted Lindsay on four counts of endangering children, one count of involuntary manslaughter, and one count of murder. In April of 2019, the proceedings started and Lindsay took the stand in her defense case where she went back on her previous statements in the interview and again denied causing any harm to Hannah between March 6th and March 8th. 
She said she admitted to things in the second interview in order to protect everybody because the detectives were asking whether Lindsay's husband or Hannah's dad, Jason, could have harmed her and she didn't want anyone else to get in trouble. The trial lasted eight days and the jury deliberated for 12 hours before finding Lindsay Parton guilty on charges of murder and voluntary manslaughter and four counts of child endangerment. She was then sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 18 years. In November of 2020, Lindsay's attorney, Neil Shewitt, appealed the court's decision to the Ohio Supreme Court, stating this case raises substantial question and is one of public or great general interest. But in March, the Supreme Court declined to hear the case due to the jury hearing Lindsay's confession to slapping, hitting, poking, and shaking the baby, not to mention many doctors gave testimony about how long Long the child could have been acting normally after a fatal head injury, and they concluded that it would have only been seconds or minutes. With that being said, we have reached the end of this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching all the way until the end. If you enjoyed the video, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button, especially since we're doing a small giveaway when we reach 500 subs. Also, leave a comment on what case I should cover next. Okay, love you, bye!